Thanks very much. So thanks very much for coming out. Uh, you know, when we talk about sex, a couple of things happen. Some people get a little bit uncomfortable and they're worrying that, especially during a public talk, oh no, is he going to pick on me? Is he going to sort of point me out and, and are, is everybody in the room going to know that, you know, I have erectile dysfunction? Well, looking around the room, probably most of you do, so don't worry about it. <laughs> the, um, I'll show you some numbers, I'll show you some statistics, but the truth is that, unfortunately, as we get older, it becomes more and more common that erectile dysfunction becomes a real fact of life for many of us, and, and that's fine, and the good news is that over the last 20 years, we actually have very effective medication that can effectively manage erectile dysfunction. And it's easy for us to look at having problems in the bedroom as being really very minor, but I'll share with you tonight some of the data that says that it's an important part of quality of life, it's an important part of intimacy, but also it can actually be an early harbinger of cardiovascular disease. So if you think of it, when we're talking about erections and erection quality, in order to get a good erection, what has to happen is the blood flow that normally is very, very slow to the penis, maybe one or two drops a minute, has to increase by 10 or, or larger numbers fold increase. In fact, if you're standing here and you start running, the blood flow to your heart increases by about five or six fold, the coronary blood flow to the heart. How many fold increase do you think you would see when you go from a soft penis to a full erection? How many fold increase do you think you would see? Take a guess. If the heart increases fivefold, what do you think the penis blood flow has to increase by? Ten. Tenfold. It's actually about a hundredfold in order for it to work normally. And because it is a vascular bed in the body that needs to increase more than any other place in our body, it's an early warning sign that something may be not working quite right. So I just picked on you guys, but I'm not going to be picking on anybody. But everything is good? It's working well? <laughs> I just wondering, early comments that also came from yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I didn't bring my wife. So we're going to talk a little bit about men's health. We're going to talk a little bit about erectile function and vascular disease. Um, I'm happy to answer any question that pertains to anything I know about, which is typically urology. Uh, sexual health, sexual function, prostate disease, voiding dysfunction, incontinence, and we can have a nice open discussion. It's a relatively small group, and I think we can get to most of your questions. If you have anyone that's sort of a burning question, don't be shy, just raise your hand, stop me in the middle of what I'm saying, and we can deal with it right then. So men's health. Men are particularly bad as being advocates for our own health. Usually what happens in most relationships, it's the female partner that advocates for the male's health. Men typically ignore anything related to health. And the result is this, that within Canada, we think now it's about an extra cost to the healthcare system because of how poorly most men take care of themselves, about $37 billion a year. And that's largely because we're not active enough, we're smoking, we have too much weight, and we have too much alcohol. And the studies would tell us that if we were able to cut back, increase our exercise, lose some weight, watch what we're shrinking, uh, smoking and drinking, that 70% of those extra costs and the consequences to our health care could actually be really reduced significantly. And if we looked at what it would give you in your pocketbook, if you were able to stop doing some of those bad habits, the five drinks a day works out to $3 million over the course of your lifetime. If you could stop smoking cigarettes, whether it's a quarter pack a day or two packs a day, you can see there's lots of money there. And so at the end of the day, if you were able to stop all of these bad habits, which would be a hard thing to do, but even if you reduce them, um, you could see that there'd be extra money in your wallet and obviously a major decrease in our health care budget. So how does an erection work? For most men, you have a penis. And for most women, you probably know somebody who has a penis. And the question is, how does it go from being flaccid to being fully erect? So it's really very, very simple. What needs to happen is there needs to be some sort of stimulation. It could be something in your mind. You're thinking of something sexual. It could be tactile. Someone touches you in a certain way. Someone talks to you. So there's a whole variety of different stimuli that can cause a chemical signal to be released 
into the penis, and we call that a neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter releases a chemical that causes the blood vessels in your penis to get wider, to open up, blood flows in. But that's not the whole story, and you'd think that that's all it takes to get an erection. Well, if the blood would flow into the penis quickly, it would also flow out quickly, and you wouldn't end up with an erection. So the real magic of an erection is the blood has to flow into the penis so quickly that it actually overcomes the ability of the venous channels, which carries the blood out of the penis, to carry blood out as quickly. And as a result, what happens is it grows, it distends, it becomes pressurized. And the reason it pressurizes is from the soft or flaccid state where everything is all contracted, in the erect state, the muscles and the spaces, we call them sinusoids, that's the spaces in the penis where the blood vessels are stored, gets distended and actually squeezes off all these blood vessels that normally carry the blood away. So we call it a veno-occlusive mechanism. And unfortunately, it's a very common cause of erectile function in young men, that their veins don't get squeezed off properly, or that they've had some trauma to their penis, and a certain part of their penis can't squeeze that blood off. And as a result, all the stimulation in the world causes a little bit of fullness and a little bit of rigidity, but it's inadequate to have normal sexual function because the penis never gets fully rigid. And in fact, if it works normally, a man's penis should get much, much harder than his maximum blood pressure. We call the, the top number on your blood pressure your systolic blood pressure, and the bottom number your diastolic. So the top number, when your doctor says your blood pressure is 120 over 80, that top number is every time your heart squeezes, that's the pressure in the blood vessels. And the bottom number, that 80, is the number when your heart is relaxing. And what happens is the penis needs to get hard enough that it's three or four times harder than the systolic blood pressure. And if you think of it, how is that possible? If the blood is flowing in with arterial pressure, how does it get so much pressure higher than the arterial pressure, than the systolic blood pressure? That's because what happens is you squeeze the blood in the penis off, it can't leave, and then the muscles compress, and as a result, it becomes three or four times higher than systolic blood pressure. So on TV shows, like uh, Grey's Anatomy or other places, you'll hear storylines where they say the guy fractured his penis. He broke his penis. And that actually can happen. And probably four or five times a year, we get a very embarrassed guy that comes into the emergency here, and he's really shy. And what happened is he was having relations with his partner. Usually she's on top, and she misses. He has a full erection, and she just snaps it in half. I can see most of the guys cringing, yeah. The good news for most of you in the audience is probably your penises are never going to get hard enough for that to happen. It usually happens to guys in their 20s or 30s. When you get in your 50s and 60s, if she misses, it just bends like a banana. <laughs> so you see, there's a good thing to getting older. OK. Um, over the last 20 years, we've learned that, um, in fact, it's a natural uh, gas that's released within the penile vasculature called nitric oxide. And actually, nitric oxide was called Molecule of the Year back in 1992. Uh, that's when we found out that this release of gas from the nerve endings, from the lining of the blood vessels called the endothelium, is really the actual critical thing that causes erectile function to actually be augmented and turned on. And so, um, how many of you are scientists? Raise your hand. Okay. So, we don't really need to go into great depth about it. And the beauty is, now I can say anything, you guys are going to believe me. Um, but no. What happens is this gas is released from sexual stimulation. And what this gas does is basically through a series of pathways, it actually causes the muscle in the penis to relax. So you see, your mother was right all along. When it wasn't working well, and she said, just relax, relax. That's actually what has to happen here. The muscles have to relax, blood flow increases, and you get an erection. Now, how many of you have heard about Viagra? Raise your hand. OK. Yeah? You heard about it? OK, your friend uses it. Um, <laughs> So, um, so what Viagra does is Viagra works right here on this part of the pathway. And what this enzyme, phosphodiesterase 5, PDE5, does is it breaks down this chemical as quickly as it's made. This chemical is the absolute most important thing to cause an erection because it directly causes the muscles to relax, the blood flow to increase, and the erection to happen. And so you're saying, well, why would Pfizer, which was a, a really good drug company back in the mid and early 90s, good thing to invest in at that point, not so much now maybe, but anyway, um, why would they focus on this 
rather than focusing on this? And the answer is because if you block this enzyme, you don't get degradation of cyclic GMP. And whatever cyclic GMP you make, it hangs around for much, much longer. It gives you much better relaxation. And the beauty is your body has to make the cyclic GMP. So if you have your grandchildren over and your grandchildren are just jumping up on your leg and playing with you, you're not making any cyclic GMP. And even if they surprised you and you took your Viagra tablet an hour before they came over, you're not going to get an erection. You're only going to get an erection if you've taken Viagra if you have lots of stimulation that you produce this cyclic GMP and that'll improve because now it's not going to be degraded and so it builds up and it gets stronger and stronger and your erection hopefully is better and better. The one problem is with Viagra and Cialis and Levitra and all the drugs that target this enzyme that if you don't make cyclic GMP, like if you've had a prostate cancer operation or maybe you have multiple sclerosis or you have some other nerve pathology, then it isn't quite as effective. And so we have other alternative therapies for those individuals. But that's a little bit of physiology. And now we'll go into sort of the more um, common issues related to sexual function. You know, M Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith may both come into my clinic with erectile dysfunction, but the causes can be very, very different. Mr. Jones may have a problem that he has poor blood supply, and so he can't get an erection. Um, but Mr. Smith actually may have a problem that his nerves aren't really signaling the blood vessels correctly. They both will have the same symptoms. They both can't get an erection, but the causes are different and the treatments may be different. And then there may be a third patient who comes in and his problem is he has low testosterone. So how many of you have heard advertisements or stories about testosterone? Raise your hand. You know, um, erectile function is one of the real growth industries in North America. And the problem is that we live just north of the US. And in the US, I think the medical community um, is, is very much different than it is in Canada. In, the, in Canada, I think every physician that you're going to ever meet is probably busier than they want to be. No one is really looking for patients. We're all totally tapped out. We're as busy as we ever want to be. If I speak to my colleagues, and I was in Miami just last week speaking to a whole bunch of, of colleagues, they all have extra space in their clinics. They all can take on more patients. More patients, more revenue, so they're happier. They always have open doors. And as a result, there's this sort of pull to try and promise more and make, uh, make claims that maybe aren't reachable. And that's what's happened. We get a lot of the US media and a lot of the US information. And testosterone is one of those areas where they claim it'll make you smarter, make you run faster, um, make you a better lover. Um, and the truth is testosterone has a very important physiologic role. And we can talk about it a little bit more. You just have to be careful about some of the claims of testosterone that are made in the media. And you probably heard that over the last 10 years, there have been two large class action lawsuits from people who claimed that the makers of testosterone failed to disclose the potential cardiovascular risks. Well, it turns out that those class action lawsuits were unfounded and the courts have thrown them out. So it's a safe medication in the right person uh, with the right indications. Then there's also men who have problems with erectile function because they have something called Peyronie's disease. Does anybody know what Peyronie's disease is? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about it later. It just is a curved penis. It's what Bill Clinton had. Uh, you know, he was, uh, Paula Jones, I think, said that she could identify Bill Clinton's penis. It's because he had a big curve on his penis. So I'll show you a picture of Bill Clinton's penis later. <laughs> <clears throat> It's pretty impressive. Um, I don't know if you've heard some of the stuff that's going on about Donald Trump's penis. It's supposed to look like a mushroom. So anybody that wants to go in politics, beware. Um, medications can have a big effect on erectile function as well. Um, another group of things that can cause problems with erections are situation, stress, anxiety. Um, and what that does is, you know, I was saying that an erection really depends on having your blood vessels relax opening up. Um, if you're stressed, anxious, nervous, what happens is your palms get a little bit sweaty, your palms maybe turn white, your blood vessels um, in your feet contract, and also in the extremities, in all parts of your ears, the blood flow decreases to your ears. So it's a fight or flight response. And the way we're designed is if you're being chased by a bear in the woods, do you want to have an erection? No, no. You want all your blood going to your heart and your brain and the big muscles of your legs so you can run away from that bear. So 
that's how we're designed. So if you're particularly stressed out, like you're nervous you're not going to perform, it's a new partner, you want to impress her or him, um, you may not get a good erection because your adrenaline is circulating and it actually reverses the effect of getting a normal erection. Lots of psychological causes of erectile dysfunction. And the truth is most people, it's a combination of both. It's a combination of organic and situational, physiologic, physical causes and situational causes. So what we try and do in our clinic is try and help men understand uh, what's going on, why it's happening to them. We can do some blood tests and we have some special equipment here at St. Joe's where we can actually look through the skin of the penis, see the blood flow, see the blood vessels and actually determine is it a blocked artery, is it something else and then we can deal with that problem in many cases. So I said that in this room probably many of you have a friend who has erectile dysfunction or you have some degree of erectile dysfunction. That's not unusual. This was a study that was a landmark study done in the early 90s and what they looked at was almost 1300 men between 40 and 70 and you can see here roughly half of the population had some degree of problems in the bedroom. Really, really common. Now granted, not all these men had complete erectile dysfunction which would mean the inability to get an erection in all situations at all times. Uh, about a third of them had moderate or minimal erectile dysfunction, but it was still a problem. It bothered them enough that they would be classified as having problems. And so what we usually do in the clinic is we try and figure out, is it because of age? Is it because of chronic diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, depression? Or is it something else related to the medications they're on, cardiovascular disease? Or is it lifestyle? And the beauty of lifestyle things is that they can typically be reversed. And the truth is for most causes of erectile dysfunction, because they typically relate to vascular disease, there's usually not a whole lot we can do to reverse the cause. We can treat the symptoms, we can improve erectile function, we can improve quality of life, but really reversing the causes is pretty unusual unless it is something like a hormonal issue that we can address. So this is the deadly quartet. These four dudes, they all have erectile dysfunction. They're sitting at the, uh, the hamburger bar and you can see it's obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes. And those are four killers for erectile function. So this is a map that shows you the darker the color, the higher the incidence of morbid obesity. BMI is over 35. So that means these guys aren't just a little overweight. These are people who self-report as being really fat. And you can see the darker colors here in the orange and the reds and the darker shades. Typically it's in the, the southwest and the, uh, and the southern part of the U.S. in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. So the shocking thing is this is a year apart. You can see how rampant and how prevalent the problem with obesity is. It really is an epidemic. And if you did a slide that looked just like this, in Canada it's exactly the same, and if you had an overlay that showed the incidence of diabetes, it would be exactly the same. Incredibly common, incredibly prevalent, and for those of you who have diabetes, you know that it affects a number of other physical features in addition to just erectile function. So that has to do with obesity, please. Would that also uh, be whether uh, you're living in a higher density area of the city versus rural, or city versus rural? Have they done that? <clears throat> well, you know, it's interesting. You would, you would think that people who are in a rural environment maybe are more active, maybe more physically fit, but it, the data doesn't actually show that, and it may be related to diet. And many people now who, you know, it certainly does vary based on your occupation. So someone who's a postal worker in a, med, a mail carrier, typically they're quite fit. They may walk 10 or 15 kilometers a day. Someone who sits at a desk has less of an advantage because they're typically sedentary. Um, and people who live in urban environments typically um, have exposure to a lot of other features, like more gyms, more other things, and, and they may be more motivated. So the, the demographics depend on a number of variables, but one of those variables is age. And I think you can see here, everybody would agree, you know, when you're looking at decades of life, your fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh decade of life, the incidence of erectile dysfunction, you can see increases directly with that decade of life. So, but the interesting thing is, if you look at this, if you're in your 40s, you have almost a 40% chance that you do have some degree of erectile dysfunction. Very, very common. Now, what happens if you have cardiovascular disease? So if you have cardiovascular disease, the age doesn't have nearly the same impact. And that's because if you're 40 to 49 and you have cardiovascular disease, you have almost a 60% chance of having erectile function problems at that point. 
So it really is interesting that age predicts erectile dysfunction, but if you have other comorbid or other medical problems like diabetes or cardiovascular disease, the predictive value of age alone is actually lessened. So back about 20 years ago, some really, really innovative, out-of-the-box thinkers looked at what is the cause of cardiovascular disease. And they actually looked at inflammation, the inflammation that happens within the vasculature, the lining of the blood vessel, and they looked at causes that could link and could cause greater inflammation that would link to uh, erectile function issues, cardiovascular disease. And so I want you all now just to think back to 1992, so 35 years ago roughly. Okay, 35, 36 years ago. What was happening back in 1992? Well, this was a cool car, okay, back in 1992. It got 15 liters, to the, 15 liters per 100 kilometers. Michael Jackson was, a, was alive and a big hit, right? Um, but what was happening in healthcare was that men, unfortunately, were smoking, were sedentary, were at high risk of cardiovascular disease, and men were literally dropping in the streets because of heart attacks, strokes, and in fact, in that one year, the increase, it was a growth industry, ICUs, cardiac care units. And when we look at the statistics, luckily they've now come down significantly. But back in that time frame, in the early 90s, there were more than 600,000 men who died of cardiovascular disease. And so it was within that sort of context, that environment, that the researchers were really looking at what was going on. This again was back in the early 90s. Um, you could see that you know, there was a lot of life events that were happening. Uh, I put this up because Prince Charles is 70 today. Um, and uh, boy, he looks quite young there, doesn't he? So what happens to, to develop a drug is a very prolonged process. It's quite complicated. Some researcher in some lab in some part of the world comes up with an idea, comes up with a molecule that he thinks may affect some important physiologic change. They test it first in animals to see if it's toxic. They test it first from a biochemical standpoint and pharmacokinetic parameters to see how long does it last, how well does it get absorbed, what does it actually do. And then they go ahead and they put it into healthy individuals and they make sure that the healthy individuals absorb the drug and what effect it has on them. And then after they do that, that's called phase one trials, they go to phase two trials in humans. Phase two is the first time they put their drug into people who have that disease. And they're very careful. They make sure they give a very low dose and they give it to relatively healthy people and they give them uh, a couple of days on the medication and they look at a whole bunch of parameters. Well, of course, this is the lead into the story about Viagra, right? So what happened was in the early 90s, 1992 actually, uh, Pfizer was looking at a drug to treat cardiovascular disease because 600,000 men had died the year before. And they had this drug called sildenafil and they gave it to men with the idea that it would increase blood flow because they knew that it actually stopped the degradation of cyclic GMP and it improved coronary blood flow. And if you improve blood flow of the heart, maybe you'll decrease heart attacks. Well, it wasn't so great for that and it didn't really change blood pressure very much. But it was interesting because when the men came back to the investigators, they didn't want to give back the drug and the investigators couldn't understand why. And, and some smart investigators said, well, why don't you want to give back the drug, Mr. Jones? And he said, I had a woody like I haven't had in years. <laughs> it, was, it was in England. It was in Sandwich, England. My accent isn't very good. Um, so they asked a few other guys, and some of the other guys said, oh yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't roll out of bed anymore. Um, so it was terrific, and they then decided to go on a drug development program to actually look at whether that drug would actually work. And so it really was, the science of impotence became in the public forum. You know, before that, it was sort of really embarrassing to talk about erectile dysfunction. And I can tell you a personal story um, that um, I did pretty well in, in university, and I did pretty well in medical school and I was funded by my parents who put me through school and stuff and uh, my dad was pretty concrete. He was in real estate and when I told him that I was going to be going into urology, he said, urology? Why would you want to go into urology? You could do something like ophthalmology. They make a lot of money. Or, you know, it's a nice clean profession. You see people, they never die, they never get better. You have patients for the rest of your life. And I said, well, I want to do urology. I think it's a good field. I think there's lots to do and everything else. And my dad didn't understand why I was doing that. And then 1992 came around in 1993, and Viagra actually, the early studies were in mid-90s, 1995, and the approval was 1998. By 1998, with Viagra was released, I was still at McGill at the time, my dad put his hand around me and he said, Jerry, 
I understand now. Viagra is a godsend, and you are in the best field of medicine. And, <laughs> and by the way, do you have any samples? Because my friends <laughs> all want samples. <laughs> so um, I explained to my father the underlying cause of erectile dysfunction, and I said, it, you know, maybe it's your diabetes, dad, or your sedentary lifestyle, or the fact that you're a little overweight. And he said, yeah, 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 where are the samples? <laughs> So this is the anatomy of the penis, and what happens is it's actually kind of complicated. And you can see this is the urinary channel, and this is the penis is made up of muscle. And all of this muscle gets filled with blood, and the muscle actually has to relax. And you have, it's almost like an aircraft biplane design where you have these internal struts. And there's a little reason I'm telling you all of this anatomy story, because I'm going to explain to you what Bill Clinton had in a few minutes, and this will help you understand what went wrong with Bill. So the, the, there's sort of an internal architecture of the penis, and there's uh, intertwined smooth muscle, and all of that has to operate properly for the whole thing to work. And it, it actually is kind of complicated. And when you see a diagram like this that really talks about all the different receptors where nitric oxide works in terms of cyclic GMP, and there's other receptors here, and you're looking at it, this is the nerve that causes the erection. For someone like me, this is a, a really exciting picture. I go home every night, and when I go to bed, I look at a picture like this, and I say, wow, think of all the possibilities. All of these represent targets for future drugs, where we can look at improving how well the drugs affect erectile function. So what I've told you so far is that Viagra works by causing greater smooth muscle relaxation. And if you think when you're taking a shower, either this morning or tomorrow morning, and you're in the shower and the water temperature is not right, it's a little too cold, you have two choices, right? You can either turn up the hot or turn down the cold. So we've all focused so far on turning up the hot by actually causing the blood vessels to dilate more. But a whole part of the new research we're looking into erectile function is trying to inhibit the pathways that cause the blood vessels to constrict. If you inhibit constriction, you cause di dilatation. And so some of the new agents that are coming down the research pipeline focus on many of these really exciting targets to improve erectile function. But let's get to the meat of the talk, because I'm running a little bit long. And what happens is the inner layer of your blood vessel called the endothelium is absolutely critical for health, heart health and erectile function. And it releases a whole bunch of different chemicals. And what happens is as we get hardening of the arteries, that you get calcification, thinning of the vessel lumen, and ultimately complete obstruction with maybe a plaque formation and release of that little plaque from the inside lining that causes obstruction of the blood vessel. And the causes of endothelial dysfunction, that's the other ED, and erectile dysfunction, are absolutely the causes that we talked about. High blood pressure, diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking, and aging. And the outcomes of impairment of your endothelium, when your vessels become like pipes, lead pipes, as opposed to nice, elastic, flexible channels for your blood to flow, you end up with all of these problems. Erectile dysfunction, a kidney disease, peripheral vascular disease, and ultimately, stroke and heart attack. And so, the question is, I told you before that the heart probably increases fivefold from rest to maximum activity, whereas the penile vasculature increases a hundredfold. It's more than just that. It's also the fact that the blood vessels in the penis, despite every man in this room probably thinks he has a big penis, um, your blood vessels in your penis are about a quarter the size of the blood vessels in your heart. And because of Laplace's law, just like when you're you're taking out your hose and you're watering your lawn, if it's not going far enough, the stream of water, you just constrict it and what happens is the flow increases dramatically and you can get that water stream further. As you restrict the size of the diameter of the vessel, the amount of flow decreases dramatically by a factor of R to the second power. And so what happens is in your carotid over here in your neck, or in your coronary arteries, the size of the blood vessel and penis are much, much smaller, and so they're much more prone to getting blocked. And that's why we think it's an early warning of heart disease. So I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides just to say that really 
The idea of exercise is an amazing concept. If you could exercise, you lower your blood pressure, you increase your muscle mass, you decrease your fat mass, and actually a number of really good things happen to the inside lining of your blood vessel compared to this dude here who's just sitting, and the blood flowing through the vessel increases dramatically. But in fact, there was a really good Canadian study that looked at erectile function as being a predictor of cardiovascular disease. It was uh, done in Montreal by, um, uh, by uh, Dr. Grover, uh, who did amazing work and showed, in fact, that your ability of erectile function to predict your cardiovascular and coronary risk factors is dramatic. Now, you can see here that your tertiles of risk based on how bad your heart disease is and how bad your erectile dysfunction, they go up absolutely in the same line. And of course, the older the patient is, the more predictive they are to have heart disease as well as erectile dysfunction. So there's a number of factors and the factors are common. The same factors that predict your risk for a coronary disease also predict your likelihood of having erectile dysfunction. So this is the story here that if you have really severe erectile dysfunction, your cardiovascular risk is really, really high over a 10 year period. And for those of you who have no erectile dysfunction, that's actually predictive that you probably have a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So having an erection is actually a good sign that you have a good, healthy vascular system. Um, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about this one study. It was called the PCPT trial. And I'm gonna go through much of the data here because really the whole message is in this one slide. I'll get to you in one sec. So this I think was probably the coolest study that was ever done. So it was called the Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial. And they looked at thousands and thousands of men and they exposed them to a drug to try and prevent prostate cancer. And they looked at a group of men who got placebo sugar tablet, and a group of men that got an active drug that shrunk the size of the prostate, Proscar. So some of you may know Proscar. And what they wanted to see is, did the drug, compared to the sugar tablet, prevent prostate cancer? So that was the study, and they looked at 18,000 men, and they looked at them over a period of seven years, and that's the group of patients we're talking about, but not really. In this paper, what Ian Thompson reports on is just the group that got placebo. So just the sugar tablet group. That's all he looked at, okay? So it's roughly 9,000 patients who got sugar tablet for seven years. So you're thinking to yourself, why is he going on about this? I'll tell you in a second. Now, what he did was he looked at all the men who got the sugar tablet, who at the beginning of the, the study, with seven years, had normal erectile function, because they actually got you to fill out a questionnaire. So now he has a group of roughly 2,500 men who have normal erectile function and get a sugar tablet and see the doctor every three months for seven years. What he did was, he said, of those initial 2,500 men, how many developed erectile function problems during the course of that seven year study? And that's the group he looked at. New onset erectile dysfunction in a group of men who were followed every three months, really on a prostate cancer prevention trial. And what he found was, if you were to develop new onset erectile dysfunction, here's what happened to your risk of a heart attack or a stroke. In fact, you can see over a five year period, your risk was 11%. So more than one in 10 of the men who develop new onset erectile dysfunction are gonna have a heart attack or stroke within five years. So incredible, isn't it? That why would that be? Well, there were lots of other studies that were done that looked at that after Ian Thompson presented his data saying that early onset erectile dysfunction gives you about two and a half or three years lead time for before you have a heart attack and a stroke. That's a warning that if you're developing new onset erectile dysfunction, you should see your doctor and say, should, are, my, are my coronaries okay? Maybe do a stress test, maybe figure out what's going on. Because wouldn't it be fabulous if you did see that physician and he made some changes, controlled your blood pressure, you changed your diet, you stopped smoking, you do things, and you don't have that heart attack or stroke. The best way to treat a heart attack or stroke is not to have it. So this was absolutely incredible work and it changed the way we think about it. And then there were about 15 or 20 other studies that all did some, some work. One study was really cool. Um, there was a Francesco Montorsi who's an Italian investigator. He's a urologist, his brother is a cardiologist. And so the two Montorsi brothers looked at patients in the cardiac care ICU and interviewed them and said, Mr. Alfonso, whatever, 
when did you, you had a heart attack last week, do you have erectile function? 90% said yes. They'd ask them, when did you first start having symptoms? On average, two and a half to three years before. You had a question. Yeah, just a question. I don't know if I'm 50 years with diabetes, 21. Yeah. And uh, I'm one of your patients. And uh, you said that uh, what I was, when you were talking about the, uh, the direct link between ED and heart disease, should I be actually having, like, you know, getting checked out for the heart disease, actually? Yeah. So if you have, what most physicians will do is they'll do some questions. They'll just ask you a history. Um, do you have shortness of breath? Um, can you walk up two flights of stairs without getting short of breath? Can you walk uh, a mile in 15 minutes without getting short of breath? They'll look at your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and some other factors, and they'll risk stratify you whether you need more invasive testing. They'll do a cardiogram. Um, and some people, they may do a stress test. So that would be something that is reasonable if you're symptomatic. Um, the issue with diabetes, though, unfortunately, is there are many men with diabetes who will have silent ischemia. They will have impaired blood flow to the heart, but they will be symptom free. So that's something you'd want to talk to your doctor about. Okay? Good. So, Graham Jackson, unfortunately, he died. Uh, he was a wonderful cardiologist out of the UK, uh, and he was a real proponent of the idea that men with heart disease uh, need to worry about erectile function. Men with erectile dysfunction, that's a sign that you have occult heart disease, and you should really look at it. He was one of the early proponents of this, and so until proven otherwise, if you have ED, it's an early warning sign of silent vascular disease, and that was a concept that really was hard for a lot of people to understand. Um, there's many medications that can have a direct effect on erectile function. Uh, we don't need to go through that. Um, the last little bit I'll share with you tonight really is the story of men who have mild erectile dysfunction. And so early age onset, mild erectile dysfunction. The bottom line is there's been lots of studies now, and even if you have a mild degree of vasculogenic erectile dysfunction, it is predictive of coronary artery insufficiency. So that's something to look at. And there's lots of studies that talk about it as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And uh, in fact, mild is not stro as strong a predictor as moderate erectile dysfunction. Severe erectile dysfunction is a greater predictor than moderate. And so it is graded degrees of predictability based on how bad your erectile function is. For younger men, it's particularly strong, that link between onset of erectile dysfunction and uh, cardiovascular disease. Again, this is looking at uh, coronary artery disease and the thickening and the size of the blood vessels and risk of uh, bad events in men with erectile function issues and men without. So you can see the, the rate as you get older. The reason here that these two graphs come together is that most men in their 70s probably have some degree of erectile dysfunction and some degree of risk for coronary artery disease. Whereas when you're younger, if you have no erectile dysfunction, the risk of having coronary artery disease and problems is small, but if you have ED, even in that young age group, that's something you should look at. Okay, so I'm gonna just finish off with these last couple of things. You know, we think about drugs like Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra as being exclusively to improve erectile function, and many of you probably know that Cialis is now actually approved for treatment of men's urinary symptoms, lower urinary tract symptoms. And you just have to take it on a daily basis. Well, um, this was a, a, a report that we published a few years ago now with Dr. Gann. He's a plastic surgeon here, and he's really, really an excellent clinician. And he had this unfortunate diabetic patient with poor blood flow to his index finger. And Bing had tried everything to salvage this over the course of several months, and he was developing uh, really a gangrenous index finger of his left hand. And he said, Jerry, why don't we try and just give him a PD-5 inhibitor? Let's just see if we can improve the blood flow. Maybe we'll do something, because if I can't get that finger to have greater blood flow, we're gonna have to amputate that digit. And he was a fairly young individual, and obviously this would have a major consequence on the man. Um, you can see what happened uh, with six weeks of therapy, actually, improvement in blood flow. And so there's a whole variety of different parts of the body where PD-5 inhibitors can actually cause vasodilatation. You probably know or have heard that drugs like Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra are commonly used by mountain climbers because it improves your ventilation perfusion in your lungs. It lets you climb up the mountain. Unfortunately, the Olympic Committee uh, doesn't allow them uh, to be used because it actually is performance enhancing. But I think in the Olympic Village, they do use them anyway for other performances. Um, so this is just a couple of slides. This is the, uh, the Bill Clinton story. So what can happen in about 
five to seven percent of men is that there's a bit of an injury that occurs on the top part of your penis where it should be nice elastic fibers and you develop a scar and it's sort of like putting a band-aid on a balloon as you blow up the balloon if you had a band-aid that stopped that part of the balloon from stretching longer and wider it would curve up towards where the band-aid is so that's what happens and so, um, as I said, Paula Jones said that Bill Clinton has a curved penis and she could identify it. And um, it's funny because there's a lot of US presidents apparently who have Peyronie's disease. I think Trump apparently has shrinking of his penis, but we're not sure why that is. This is what happened to George Bush. It was uh, Thanksgiving on the White House lawn where that was the incident that occurred to him. Um, we think that this is probably what happened to Bill Clinton as well. That, Powerful men and presidents are, uh, are attractive to dogs, I guess. Um, and I just wanted to share with you that, in fact, there's an incredible amount of very exciting science that's going on into the field of erectile function issues. We're looking at gene therapy. We're now, you know, this is everyday therapy, pharmacotherapy, using medications to improve function. But gene therapy can actually transform how well the smooth muscle and the blood vessels work. Stem cell therapy. Uh, we're looking at tissue engineering where, unfortunately, many U.S. and Canadian uh, war veterans have had improvised explosive devices and they've been injured and lost parts of their, their anatomy. So there's actually now some studies going on to actually rebuild genetically uh, the muscle in the penis and the skin and everything else. It's really very, very exciting. So I'll give you a summary that I think there's a clear relationship between erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. I think erectile dysfunction, apart from having an impact on quality of life and all of the great advances we've made in the last 20 years really can be predictive of cardiovascular disease, specifically in younger individuals. As we get older, many of us have cardiovascular disease, but in the man who's in his 30s and 40s and even 50s, it's something to think of. And identification of ED and treatment of the risk factors that may lead to a cardiovascular event really would be something to keep in mind. So I'll just leave you this last cartoon and I'll read it for you. Some of you in the back maybe can't read it. So the man has now been examined. He's changing back into his clothes. And the doctor is talking to his wife and he says, your husband is suffering from a very severe stress disorder. Um, if you don't do the following, he will surely die. Uh, this is a guy who has severe sexual dysfunction um, and he's not responding at all. Uh, each morning, fix him a healthy breakfast, be pleasant at all times for lunch, make him a nutritious meal for dinner, prepare an especially nice meal. No chores, no nagging, and yes, make love several times a week. Do this for the next year and he'll regain his health completely. Well, he gets dressed and he's walking out the clinic with his wife and he says, what did the doctor say? She said, you're going to die. <laughs> Thank you very much.